go on and on. I have 15 minutes, and I will hold to my promise. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, this uh, I'm really happy to have come with this specific uh, sector we've been working on it's there because it answers Johannes's concern that you know usual uh, value chain work in the end you know ends up leaving behind those uh, farmers that are not into the cash crop sequence and how do we do to, you know how do we get them in the game when they're not even able to feed themselves and so um, here we are with rice in Senegal it's actually very peculiar uh, with the future, we've been asked to focus and to select a few commodities, and rice was part of the game. However, in Senegal, it turns out that rice, depending on where you're growing it, is a very different commodity. In the north of Senegal, in the Senegal River Valley, irrigated zone, uh, you've got, you know, last year's statistics generated uh, 500,000 tons of rice produced by 60,000 farmers, high yield, 6.5 tons per hectare and with marketed output between 30 and 80 percent okay so you've got a commercial market you've got small farmers i mean the farms are between one and two hectares a few larger scale guys but it's a small farmer population we could say okay let's just work there get it done and we're reaching our objectives however when you look to the south the south forest zone which is casamance and the land around the gambia it's a completely different game. The statistics show 100,000 tons of rice produced by 200,000 farmers, okay? With yields of one ton per hectare, it's rain-fed rice, okay? And these farmers barely cover 60% of their household needs and usually cover the gap either with millet and often by selling millet or getting, using remittances to buy imported rice to make it to the end of the year. So, in the north, it's easy. Well, easy. <laughs> it's not easy, okay? But you've got something that looks pretty much, and we're working pretty much like Lewis is doing uh, on his uh, soybean program. There's a market, and we're getting the farmers to really connect to that market. It's not easy. Great outcomes in terms of uh, income generation. But what do you do with the south, where there's no market? just people feeding themselves and not selling rice at all. Zero mark, you know, in the South, zero rice is sold. It's all eaten. So where's the market? So that's, so where do you find a market where there's no market? Well, actually, there is a market. And uh, I'm not going to go through all that slide. Pick it up on the website. It's interesting. But basically, there's like four drivers in America in, in upland rice that we found in the South. One is that if you come up with a technology that boosts yield, okay, and Nerica actually offers that capacity to bring yields up to three tons, nearly four tons per hectare, you end up having farmers having to use one quarter of the land for what they would have done for millet. For the, and then there's a switching capacity there for their own food. At one quarter per hectare, the cost becomes similar to millet, and for them the switching becomes easy because the financial cost is pretty much similar. However, they can sell seeds to their local people and at a very high price, much higher price than, uh, than regular paddy rice. There's also a very important impact at home. And a lot of Nerica farmers are women, rice farmers are women, and they greatly appreciate the reduction in work time and also the reduction in food preparation time compared to millet. So for them, it's actually a good gain. And actually, Nerica rice is actually more nutritious than corn in many, in certain varieties. And so actually, there's not a nutrition loss by really, I mean, we're like cap recapturing the nutrition loss that you have eating regular white rice, which is not really nutritious.
humanitarian aid. But has developed a whole bunch of little, you know, microcredit practices, uh, savings approaches, had little funds, you know, to buy rice, to buy food. Yeah, you don't see the map, that's what happened. And, uh, and so we implemented an approach that looks pretty much like what Lewis presented, having demo sites, demo sites managed by these NGOs. And uh, one thing we added, though, is that the demo sites doubled up as certified seed production points. And all these NGOs, in the end, are, have evolved into seed production enterprises that market both to their membership and also outside of their membership. Um, an element also, you're not missing anything on the following slide, it's just a, a list of elements, but it's important. Uh, working with a non-cash uh, value chain, you know, involved uh, important implementation shifts compared to the standard approach. Uh, the first one uh, was that we decided voluntarily to limit project funded seed procurement only to the demo sites. And, and the demo sites are only funded for seed. There's no input advances. The inputs are advanced by the networks themselves using their own funds to get it going. Uh, another approach was that foundation seed procurement was limited to the first year. Later on, the foundation seed procurement had to be handled and managed by the networks themselves who struck a deal with the research institution and fought it out to get them to honor their commitment. Um, then the promotion of full seed certification at community level, really forcing the farmers to go through the hoops of getting their seeds certified so that it becomes a tradable good. Not going for community level, good enough seed, going for the full thing so that they have a marketable seed output. Uh, another approach was also promoting NERICA, but promoting the whole package, bringing in low tillage, conservation, agriculture techniques, various mechanization options, uh, so that the farmers really, you know, get the maximum yield out of it. And uh, like I said, selection of local humanitarian NGOs as technology extension partners, and also introducing tracking databases, databases at the network level. We're not doing any data collection. At FISTIR, our m and &E department is two people. The networks we work with are the ones who are equipped with basic equipment, and they are the ones collecting the database. Just so you know, FISTIR has a database of nearly 25,000 farmers registered there with a full tracking uh, scheme that is completely inputted and managed by these farmers. Um, also, we're working with the local rural banks to provide expansion working capital and equipment purchases to the certified seed sector. Some of those networks have actually purchased tractors using uh, lease financing, lease financing that is backed by the business that has been developed uh, over the over time in the seed distribution business. And no loan guarantee mechanisms are provided by the project whatsoever. Partners, well, we got a lot of partners and uh, that's the essential part of it. I mean, we're not, we're actually just some, a linchpin and a kind of a facilitation interchange, but we're bringing together Africa Rise, the Research Institute, the local NGOs, a seed multiplier association, which are little small firms that are involved in NERICA and seed multiplication. We're bringing in local equipment manufacturers for the value, various equipment. The National Extension Service, we are working with them to organize regional debriefings so that people are aware of the power of NERICA and that it goes straight up to the government to inform their policy. We bring in local agro-dealers agro that are interested in the nascent NERICA business, and they're actually contracting the various farmer groups with the certified seed to be able to market the seed beyond the immediate catchment of the project. Local banks and MFIs to provide working capital loans to seed multiplication group and a leasing company which uh, has provided up to now two tractors to the NERICA group. Overall, with the project, we've had 20 tractors financed through leasing arrangements. The databases are very important to the program. So we really get the farmers to track their farmers and do segmented analysis. Uh, on the right, 
uh, you, you see a specific group that has tracked the, the yield uh, profile of Nerica. So you see that you've got a little part of it that are beyond the uh, four tons. Uh, you've got, and you've got quite a majority that are over the, the two ton mark. And so these profiles are actually discussed by the groups at the village level. So the villagers themselves look around and look at the profile and they know their yield and then they discuss how, what went wrong for those who didn't reach the program and those who did it can explain to their peers how they did it right and actually they're singled out as lead farmers. It's not like we're picking the lead farmers, the lead farmers emerge and actually are tracked by the networks themselves. All that information then is aggregated and then is shared to those regional debris that are organized with prop extension. And here you have disaggregated data with, you know, uh, gender disaggregated data showing adoption rates. And people are able to question, you know, like why uh, in certain zones the women are majority uh, in majority? Why in certain zones the men are a majority? And it's very clear. I mean, where you have the highest, the biggest blue uh, column is actually in the maize zone, which is north of the Gambia, where traditionally women are not involved in cereal crops. In the other ones, we're all in the Casamance zone, where women are actually the target group. But what's important is that, that that data is generated by the groups themselves, by the farmers themselves, and it's discussed amongst themselves. And it's not like it's our property, and it's very important. Just so you know, some of those NGOs are actually using the databases to manage other extension programs that they're signing with FAO and various other people. And that, I think, addresses the sustainability problem you were talking about earlier on. I'm almost done. Okay, scale up. Well, it scaled up pretty fast. We went from two tons of uh, certified seed, foundation seed. This year, we're gonna hit 614 tons. That's enough to produce 17,000 tons of rice. Uh, 614 tons, that's actually less than what we expect to get because we're getting a bumper crop. We're going to get about 1,000 tons normally of seed, but that's less than we could have had because the research institution uh, kind of bought, and we had to go to Mali to get complementary foundation seed, which raises all the regional seed law issues, and we're actually able to benefit from that. The number of farmers having planted Nerica is also growing. Uh, this year, we're expecting about 7,000 farmers could have been higher if we had had more foundation seed from the research station. The next steps, let's understand, this is very important. We are not going to build a rice mill in the south until five years from now. We had the Soros Foundation come up at our office saying they, were, they wanted to capture this growth in rain-fed rice, and they heard about America, which, which speaks a lot about George Soros' information networks and why he's so rich. But they came up and they wanted to build this massive rice mill in the south and said, no, don't do that. Just go to the north, learn how to do it, and eventually come in the south. In the south market-wise, Nerica is at the certified seed market level. The next level will be village mill, okay, servicing village buyers. Then town mill markets, where you'll have town buyers and then the industrial mill market, which is where Senegal, uh, the Senegal River Valley is right now. So, you know, there is a scaling in the market. What's interesting, and I, this is what I want to highlight, is that in the South, we've been able to get farmers, women like you saw in the first picture, to do the step up, up and connect to a commercial market. Very small, but you see the chain of events that comes after that, okay? Uh, following elements, I mean, we've had very big impacts when we talk about, you know, planes and uh, we're talking, you know, uh, what Johannes was talking about, you know, various spaces where in the institutional space, this really has caught the attention of government. Government was, wants really to boost Nerica. Initially, uh, rain-fed rice was seen as some kind of backwater kind of operation. And now, actually, they consider that Nerica is part of their rice self-sufficiency strategy. They expect Nerica to contribute at as much as 500,000 tons of rice, okay, uh, to their program. But as you know, donors are into it, 
uh, various government entities are looking into it, but that danger of having of back to the future of having it roll back to a government driven program and we're losing the kind of you know grassroots and bottom up momentum that we have and that's actually what concerns us a lot in that area is that a lot of money is going to go into it to boost Nerica, but we may end up being dragged backwards in terms of efficiency and market linkage. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jean-Michel, and I found that that 